last time we were talking about anticipating the changes because the relationships uh, can change. So today we're going to finish talking about anticipating the change and we're going to talk about the social contract or making correct the spirit, the spirit of the deal. So the last time we talked about trying to anticipate what's going to happen and then we can change before the relationship, we can change. Okay, like we gave a very simple example of if Cameron Diaz gets married with a 25 year old guy, she could anticipate that maybe he was just using her for his her money, maybe he'll want to get divorced after two years. So just in case, she's going to make some prenuptial agreement. Okay, we saw the examples of the, especially when we have a new investor with the entrepreneur, the investor wants to get their money back quickly, but the entrepreneur wants to make long-term decisions, so we can uh, anticipate that, we can anticipate the external shocks. So we finished here, so we're going to talk about the multiplex agreements. So multiplex agreements, do you understand multiplex? What does multi mean in English? Hmm? What does multi mean? Multi? Hmm. Diverse or many, right? So <coughs> we we want to kind of lock in the party. Do you understand to lock in the agreement? <coughs> lock in, lock the door, make the piece sure the people are going to do the agreement. So do you remember earlier in the course we talked about the paper company, which was supplying the paper cup to McDonald's, right? Yes. So they're supplying the paper cup to McDonald's and then they're buying paper from the paper company. So they made a negotiation with, between the three people, McDonald's, the paper cup company and the paper company. They came together okay, and they integrated their systems. Do you understand integration? Yes. We talked about their IT system, their information. So that's kind of like multiplexing the agreement. Multiplex means more than one. So we had the agreement with McDonald's, but now we're bringing in somebody else. The paper company is also involved in the agreement. Okay? Is it easier or harder for McDonald's to leave the agreement now? Easier for McDonald's to leave or harder for McDonald's to leave? So by multiplexing the agreement, it's making it more secure, right? Or long-lasting agreement. Adding more parties, adding more issues. So we're talking about something that deepens and broadens the commitment to the deal. So we talk about commitment. Are you committed? We have deeper and broader commitment by adding more parties here. Okay. So adding more parties or adding more issues to the deal. So <coughs> here's an example of a manufacturing executive. He wants to broaden the type of relationship he has. He links one customer's business to other businesses owned by his parent company. So here we have the manufacturing executive, and he has a customer. Okay, the customer is buying his product. Okay? But he asks the customer to buy products from other businesses owned by his parent company. Right? So the customer is now buying products from the other businesses too. Linked to here. Okay? He invests money in a range of joint projects. Okay, so the customer has some idea. The customer is doing their own business. Okay, I'm going to invest in the customer's business together. Okay, uh, he, may, he introduces his customers to other people. So he, he's going to introduce the customer to another person, to a supplier. Okay, so he goes out for dinner together with the customer and the supplier. Okay? Do you understand? Introduce them. Alright? So by doing all of these arrangements, is this customer going to leave me if they get a better price from somewhere else? Or stay with me? What do you think? Probably stay, right? 
Why? Because I'm investing in another one of their. I'm investing in their business. I made some relationship because I introduced them to somebody else. Okay. They're also buying things from another part of the business. Okay. So this is like multiplexing. Do you understand? Like locking the people in. Okay. Uh, another a form of multiplexing for relationships is uh, the girl or the boy could introduce you to their family. Then you make a relationship with the brother. Good relationship with the brother or the mother or the father, right? Is it easier to break up or harder to break up? Harder to break up. Right? It's a good idea. If you have a boyfriend you like, you can take them to your house quickly, introduce them to all your family. Right? You can make friends with your brother. What do you think about that idea? It's good idea. You're going to use that? <laughs> Take to the Chusok to all, meet all the aunts and the uncles very quickly, all the extended family. Hmm? What do you think? Multiplex the relationship. Hmm? And they can get some job, they can get hired by your uncle. Right? Another network. Okay. Are they going to break up? Their uncle is their boss? Your uncle is their boss? Don't think so. Trapped. Okay, so it's like, <laughs> so this guy is doing broadening the relationship or making some networks. Do you understand that idea? Yes. A little bit like McDonald's. So this means that we can predict that there could be some problem. Maybe the customer can find a cheaper product somewhere else, that cheaper than my product. Okay. So that's, that's a clear possibility. Another company will make a better or cheaper product. Okay? So I predict that possibility. And in order to stop the customer from changing, I make all of these kind of uh, multiplex with them. Okay? So <coughs> then the next point is to make the insecure contract secure. So we talked about the insecure contract. Insecure contract. Your mother tells you, you can get a dog as a pet if you do the solo, solo ID, right? But that's insecure for your mother. She's going to buy you the dog now, and then later you're going to do the uh, solo G, right? The washing up. But how can your mother be sure you're going to, you could just say no later. That's called an insecure contract. Do you understand insecure contract? Hmm? You give something up front to the other person, and then you're depending on them to do something later. Okay, so we saw another insecure contract was the entrepreneur and the investor, the doctors and the investor. Right? The investor introduced the doctor to the publishing, uh, CD publishing company. Right? Then the doctors don't need the investor anymore. That's an insecure contract. Okay? So we have to try and make them more secure. So we're talking about Costly to reverse moves by one side that give the other side an opportunity and even an incentive to terminate or favorably renegotiate the deal. So we need to make a costly to reverse move. So, yes? Well, uh, if it is insecure, why do they contract each other with each other? Because they have to. So, for example, one of my friends, he's a coach in sports, he was in Ireland. And he recently did a good job coaching the Chinese sprinters on the relay team. So they offered him a contract in China, right? So he asked me about that, and they offered him a lot of money to go to China and coach their athletes in one area of China, <coughs> right? So first he, he can, he can, they made a contract a negotiation with him, and he asked me about that. So for example, they had some big Punishment, if he leaves China after two months or three months, he has to pay them two months' salaries. He has to pay for his flight, all of those things, right? Why? Because the company is afraid that he'll just go to China, he doesn't like it, and just go home, right? Do you understand? Because in that case, it was an insecure contract for the Chinese people. They have to pay for his flight, they have to spend a lot of time to organize the apartment and do all the things for him. Right? Uh, they have to 
uh, introduce him to all the athletes, right? They're high level athletes, so it doesn't look good if he just arrives and then leaves again. It's not good for their organization, right? So that's an insecure contract for them. So how can they make sure that my friend doesn't just arrive and leave after one month because he doesn't like China? Hmm? What do they need to do? If you're the Chinese company, what are you going to do? Like you said. That kind of thing, right? <laughs> Some costly to reverse thing. Something that will be very costly for him if he has to leave. Okay? Is that fair? Do you think that's fair? He was worried about those kind of things. Also, he has to give very long notice to them if he wants to leave. He has to give them, like, if he leaves in the first year, he gets more also some punishment if he leaves in the first year, right? That kind of thing. So anyway, they have to think about the relationship too, right? Because I told my friend, he has to think about it seriously because it's not fair if he goes to China and then just leaves the next month. It's not fair for them, right? Because the thing is, we're going to talk later about the social contract. Even though they wrote down that my friend has to give three months notice and he has to pay the airfare and all of those things, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, my friend could just wait until he gets his salary and then he could just leave. Do you understand? So even though that's written in the contract, maybe they can't enforce it. Okay? He doesn't like China. He just one month, he waits until he gets paid his salary doesn't say anything to anybody, no notice, and just flies back to Ireland. Okay, some ESL teachers do that in Korea. It's called a midnight run. <laughs> because in Korea, the hog one makes that kind of thing too, right? When they hire the teacher, they have to pay back the airplane ticket and they have to pay for the hog one. What are you going to do? Be honest and say, oh, I feel homesick, so I'm leaving. So here, take the, here's the airplane ticket price, and here, don't give me any salary for the next two months, or are you just going to wait and get your salary and don't tell them anything and then just buy your own flight and go back? Which are you going to do? If you're working in the hog one. Did you understand the question? Yes. Which are you going to do? Are you going to do midnight run or be honest, tell the company and pay them all the money? Midnight run. Midnight run, right? <laughs> Some people, many people do that, okay? So that's the point we're going to talk about later, that we have to also have a social contract. Social contract means we have to trust and have a relationship with the person. Because what we write in the economic contract, sometimes it doesn't matter or it won't work, okay? So my friend knows that. He knows that he could just leave China if he wants in, in the middle of the night without them knowing and never come back again and never call them again, right? But he has to think about his reputation as a coach. If he does that, is he going to get hired as a coach somewhere else? It's quite a small community, the athletics. The top level of the athletics is quite a small community, right? So those kind of things, right? They, they know him. He already worked with them for, in the US, and he already worked with them for six months. So they know him. They have a relationship. They're friends. He, they know that before he goes to China, he's going to think about it seriously. Even if he feels lonely or homesick in China, he's going to continue and do the job, at least for one year, right? So that's kind of social contract. Do you understand the difference between economic contract and social contract? Yes. Right? Economic contract, written in the contract, everything, right? Social contract, we understand each other. We, have, we are friends. We have a, a relationship, right? We're not going to harm each other. We think it's the wrong thing to do. But anyway, if we have an insecure, insecure contract, we have to make, like the Chinese company made for my friend, at least they can make that kind of thing, right? So, here are some general tips, okay? Prevention. Use more flexible contracts with profit-sharing contingencies, okay? Uh, here we have, like, a bond. Insist the other party post a bond to be forfeited in event of a forced renegotiation. So, with my friend, he can just leave. But they could have asked him, can you put up 1,000 US dollars, or 2,000, or 5,000 US dollars into an account? That's like a bond, right? You put that money into an account, and if you leave, then we get that money. Right? You could also do that in the hog one. It could solve the problem of the midnight run, right? Tell the people you have to put up a bond. You have to put some money into an account, and then if you leave, I get the money. 
you finish your contract, you get the money. Okay? So somebody might not accept that, the worker might not accept that, so that's one way. Okay? Linkage, multiplex. Okay? Involve other players with valued future links for the other partner. So this can be in the athletics business. They let everybody know that he's working there, right? His ex-boss and so on. They make a relationship with his ex-boss, so that kind of way. Detection and avoidance. This is also an important one. They detect that he's homesick. He's, not, he's feeling homesick, right? So what can you do if your employee is feeling homesick? Or that you can see that some problem is starting. What are you going to do? Give a vacation. Give a vacation. Anything else? You're working in a hub in Korea and you hire some foreigner and they're feeling very homesick. What are you going to do? Doesn't matter. Hmm? Take them out, right? Take them out for dinner. Introduce them to some people. Help them to find a club. Local club. Okay? Try to introduce them to some other foreigners. Might that work? <laughs> Right? That can work too. Detection and, and avoidance. Right? We're using this example, a simple example of my friend or some teacher who comes to Korea. Right? But this we can use also for the companies. We have to try and detect uh, if there's going to be, keep an eye out and detect if there's going to be that problem and try to avoid it. Okay? So here's a question. Your company spends a good deal of time and money training a few important employees in skills with a very high market value. So this is a common problem for companies, right? I train, you join my company, I train you to be an investor, right? Investing in the stock market. So you have some very good skills now about a high market value. You learn the skills from me, right? What if you just leave and even take the key clients? So you're investing the money for some clients, Right? So the clients know you, they're calling you every day. So you could just leave and start your own investment company and tell all your clients, hey, come to my new company. Do you understand the risk for me? Right? I hired you, I trained you to be a very good investor. You have a number of clients. But of course there's a risk. You say, why should I keep working for Chris? I can just take my clients and make a lot of money by myself. Right? So what can Chris do to avoid this problem? What can the company do? So discuss with your partner. <coughs> when I was in Korea in 2001, this happened. I was working in the Hagwon in 2001 for one year. One of the Korean Hagwon workers, she started her own Hagwon just down the road. And she took the list of the phone numbers of all the students' parents and she called all the parents and asked them to come to her hagwon. And some of the students liked her because she was a teacher in the hagwon. So a lot of, some of the students left and went to her new hagwon, right? Isn't it illegal? Hmm? Isn't it illegal? What, isn't what illegal? To uh, take the information. Yes, I think she, should, she couldn't take the list of all the parents' names and phone numbers. But they couldn't prove that she got that. Just they were suspicious that she got that in some way. They have no proof, right? So again, it's, it might be illegal, but how can you find the proof in a practical way? Okay. So discuss how are you going to stop this from happening? Happening. Does anybody have any idea? 
What kind of contract? What do you mean? For example. Uh, so some B if you leave the company. Long term contract. So make a long term contract for five years or ten years. And if you leave, but you might think. That's okay. Fee is just five thousand dollars, but for leaving, but I'll make a big profit, <laughs> much bigger profit. It's hmm? one idea. Does anyone have another idea? Okay. So we have to make anticipatory moves. Do you understand anticipatory moves? Anticipatory moves, anticipating things. So these days, loyalty is important when we're hiring people. If on your CV it shows that you're moving from company every year, one year this company, one year that company, one year this company, right? Companies don't like that because it means that you're very likely to leave, just leave, right? So uh, companies might ask you what's your future plan in the interview, right? So one of my friends, he made a joke, right? He was just, he came back to Ireland from another country. He had worked in different places, and he said they often asked him in the interview, uh, what's your long-term plan with this company, right? And he was saying, his answer could be, oh, it depends how I feel, any day I could just decide to leave, <laughs> right? I could just up and leave any day if I don't feel good in the company. Are you going to say that? No. What are you going to say about your long-term plan in the company? Are you going to say, well, I'm only planning to work here just for two years until I find a better company. <laughs> I get some experience and find a better company. Hmm? Are you going to say that in the interview? No. What are you going to say? I want to be here forever. Yes. <laughs> right? I want to stay at least, not forever, but at least 10 years, right? I want to work up in the company, that kind of thing, right? So, when you can do the same thing if you're hiring professionals. You can see, are they loyal? Right? Use teams rather than individuals in dealing with clients. Okay, so she was just by herself dealing with the clients. So I can rotate every six months change, you deal with the clients. You then you deal with the clients, right? Or just make a team. All of you three guys are dealing with the clients. So it changes between you. Okay? Rotate the job, change your job now and again. Okay? Set up knowledge capture process. So maybe you said at the start. I can make a contract where you, you found out some secret from the company. You're not allowed to tell this company secret after you leave the job. Okay? Do you understand? So I gave you the training and taught you our secret about we have some secret for investing. Like Coca-Cola or Kellogg's Frosties, they have some secret ingredients, right? The people who work in their laboratory, they have to sign the agreement that they're never going to tell anybody what's in this uh, ingredient, right? If they tell, then they can get sued. Then you mentioned long-term contracts, okay? And benefits over time. So my brother works for a company, and they sell him the stock in the company. They give him stock option in the comp company. Do you understand stock option? Yes. And it means that that's kind of benefit related to the company. Company does well. I own part of the company. I feel like I'm more involved in the company, right? So I can get some payment in stock, or stock options, instead of money, okay? Makes me more likely to stay in the, in the company, okay? Usually, so for a lot of companies do that, especially in the US. So Facebook, there was some Irish person who was at the start of Facebook, working in Facebook, and they paid them in stock of the company. Even though it wasn't a public stock, it was just private stock. So when Facebook went, got, went public, that person made like $2 million from their stock. They were just a normal worker, right? But they were getting paid in stock. So are they going to leave Facebook? Because that's a big problem for companies like Facebook and Google, where they have the very high-skilled IT people, right? If they go to another company, big problem, or they can set up their own prop company. So they think it's a good idea to pay them in the stock of Facebook. 
then they can, as the stock is getting better, higher and higher, they have also the interest in the company and making the company better, and then their stock price goes up. Okay? Do you understand that idea? Yes. So that, that's also used. So some financial benefit, just bonus. At the end of the year, you get a bonus. Okay? So you stay until the end of the year. Some commission on your clients. If you're doing a good job, you get more commission. Okay? So some financial benefit that encourages them to stay. So in summary, we need to design our agreements and negotiate expectations that anticipate foreseeable changes in circumstances, right? So I should be able to predict that you are going to think about leaving me and starting your own company with those clients, right? That's something I could predict. So if I can predict this change, then I should be able to make the, because the agreement. So multiple, try multiplexing, okay? Making an interest web. Do you understand the web? Yes. Web that's hard to break up, right? You can do it with some boyfriend you like, make a web. Do you understand web, like spider? Yes? yes? You guys can also do it with some girlfriend you like, right? Introduce her to your mother. Try to tell your mother to make friends with her, right? Take her shopping or do something together. <laughs> right? The final thing. Uh, now you're going to be afraid, right? If your boyfriend or girlfriend asks you to their parents' house, maybe you're going to say, No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not going. You can't trap me. I want to break up. I'm breaking up with you now. You're trying to trap me. Right? So don't do the opposite. Wait, right? <clears throat> Trying to make the insecure contracts more secure. Okay? And sometimes, in the end, the best prevention is to stay out of the deal altogether. Don't make the deal in the first place. Don't buy your dog. Right? So, I think you're not going to do the solid budget, then don't buy the dog. Right? So, <clears throat> do you have any question about this part? Anticipating changes? That incentive and we give the penalty to the break the contract. Yes, but like I said, in the practical world, the penalty might not work well. Okay? Because like I explained through the hog one, people find another way around the penalty. So we can do the penalty, we can put in the penalty, but people can still find a way around the penalty. So we have to think about other ways also of dealing with that problem. Okay? So we're going to talk about that more now when we talk about social contracts, okay? So parties can agree to the same terms on paper. We make a paper contract, but we might have very different expectations about how we are going to carry out the contract. Okay? If we have, if we don't have a meeting of minds, do you understand a meeting of minds? Meeting of minds means we think the same way. The deal they've signed may, they, may fall apart, okay? So we, again, we can use a simple example of a relationship here, right? I could get married to somebody, okay? And we have the same kind of ideas. But actually, I want to have five children. She wants to have no children, okay? Uh, I want to live in the countryside. She wants to live in the middle of the city, okay? I want to do this, she wants to do that. So we made a paper agreement to get married, but it might fall apart, right? Because of these problems. So we want to get the letter and the spirit of the deal agreed from the start. So usually before getting married, people do the pre-marriage course, right? In the pre-marriage course, they talk about those kinds of things, right? Uh, do we make any agreement on paper in the marriage? We're going to have three children. I agree to have three children. I agree to live in the city. Do we write those things when we get married? No. No, we write, I agree to look after you when, whether you're poor or sick or that kind of thing, right? And it depends on your religion. But we don't make those exact agreements, right? So before you get married, you, have, you should go on a pre-marriage course and talk to the other person about those kind of things, right? Like finances. Right? Uh, how, where do they want to live? What do they want to be doing in 10 years, in 20 years? Right? And try to make some plan, which means that you have the same kind of mind. Okay? If you don't have the same mindset as another person, is it a good idea to get married? 
everything is different. No. Even though they're the you really love them. <laughs> what do you think? You really love them, but everything is different. Do you get married or not? Uh, I think you can get uh, because you're young. <laughs> <laughs> you're still romantic, right? But if you get older, I had a girlfriend when I was younger, and she was nice and fun and so on. But we had very different thinking, right? About the life. For example, she thought she wasn't religious and I was religious. So she thought if she's not happy in the marriage, just get divorced. No problem, right? Whereas I didn't, if I'm Catholic, I'm not allowed to get divorced, right? Is it easy to get married? Even if, in that case, right? She didn't want to live in Ireland or England or that kind of thing, she wanted to live somewhere else, right? Then, th those kind of problems, right? Do you understand? Yes. They are practical problems that it can be a big problem later. So you have to think about those things first. So, did I change your mind? Yes? Uh, uh, people who believe in Catholic do divorce? Yes. Ever? Just in some special case, like the other person was well, had some mental problem and they, you didn't meet them until the wedding day. It used to happen a few hundred years ago, right? Sure that kind of thing. Right? You can get an annulment. <laughs> annulment means you can annul the marriage. If the other person told you lies before the marriage, that, that kind of thing. Get in a moment. That's why we have. That was the first main split in the Catholic Church because the King of England wanted to divorce his wife, but the Pope said no. So the King wanted to get an annulment. He made some silly excuse to get an annulment from his wife, but the Pope said no. So the King in England said, "Okay, I'm making my own church." <laughs> then he killed, he executed four of his wives. It's easier than getting divorced. Right? He was a bit crazy. <laughs> King Henry. Maybe you'll see on the TV. There's a TV show about King Henry the Tudors, right? Yes. So, uh, in the Protestant Church, it depends on the church, but divorce is okay. But in the Catholic Church, it's not, right? So in Ireland, some people get separated. It means just they live in another house. They live separately from each other, but they can't marry again. Can't marry another person. Right? So. Uh, this term social contract has many different meanings depending on what we're talking about. Okay? But in this case, we're talking about the expectations held by the negotiation people about their agreement. Right? What ex we made an agreement, what expectations do we have? Do we have the same expectations or different expectations? So we have two types of under social contract. Underlying social contract, this asks the question, what? What is the real nature and duration of our agreement? The ongoing social contract answers how. How will we make decisions? How will we handle unforeseen events? Communicate, resolve disputes, right? So you're going to have to talk about this before you get married. How, if, how will we deal with the children? If we have some problem, what are we going to do? Are we going to get divorced or go to counseling, right? How can we make decisions? Okay? So it's the same for a company. This is answering the question how. How are we going to do things later? And this is answering the question what. How, what is, how long will our agreement be for? What's the nature of our agreement? So first we look at the underlying social contract. So the what part of the uh, social contract. <coughs> so this is a mistake by negotiators. They leave this implicit. Implicit means that we think the other person un understands, and we think we don't say anything, right? This can cause misunderstandings and poison a relationship. Okay? So rather than discuss their expectations during negotiations, they just project their own assumptions on the deal and let it go at that, right? So let's say if you're doing a cross-cultural marriage. You don't say anything about what country you're going to live in. I just assume we're going to live in my country, right? In some time in the future. But I don't talk to you about that. Is that a good idea? No, right? It's not. We need to talk about those things. So this is basically saying we need to discuss our expectations. Do you understand? Discuss your expectations? Yes. Okay? So if not, people just, they just make their own project, make their own assumption, 
and they don't want to talk to the other person. Sometimes it's, it's problematic to talk to the other person. So they just make their own assumption and they want to go on like in that way. This can ultimately poison a relationship when we find out that the other person didn't have the same assumption that we had. Do you understand poison? So here's an example of people who had different, different values about the negotiation. One guy says, the five words I most hate to hear in my business dealing are, it's not in the contract. Okay? Does this person like to check the contract all the time? No, they don't want to hear that. It's, it's not in the contract, right? But his negotiating counterpart is very legalistic. Always looking at the written contract. Okay, and say, this is what the contract says, this is what the contract says, okay? But the other person, the contract is not important. So they had a different assumption at the start. This guy thought, well, we made the contract, but it's not that important, really, right? Contract is just a guide. But this person thinks, no, the contract, we have to do exactly what the contract says every time, okay? So are those two people going to have a problem? Yes. Yes, they are, right? Why? Because they had a different assumption about how the business was going to be done. Why? One person thought sticking to the contract religiously. The other person, you know, we can change sometimes. If there's a different situation, we can change. So, other assumptions about autonomy versus conformity may also ruin the deal. What does autonomy mean? Autonomy means doing what you want to do. What does conformity mean? Conforming means doing what everybody is doing, or doing what the other people are doing, right? Or what you're told to do. So for example, an entrepreneur sells their company to the investor, right? They think they are going to be autonomous. They can still make all the decisions about the company. They are going to decide about uh, the growth and so on, right? Then their first day of work, the investor arrives in with a big folder. They give them the folder. They say, you need to follow all of these steps. Right? Can you see a problem starting between the entrepreneur and the investor? Here? Investor is telling them, you need to do all these things. Right? But the entrepreneur thought, I can make up my own mind. I'm going to be doing what I want. Okay? So they made the wrong assumption. Investor assumes they're going to be telling the entrepreneur what to do. Entrepreneur assumes, I'm going to decide what to do. Okay? So this is autonomy and, and conformity. So if we have different opinions about this, we can cause a problem. Okay, here are other, other where we can have problems. Right? These kind of different views are especially likely when we have small versus large people. Right? A small company and a large company make a contract. Right, the large company might think they are going to tell the small company what to do. The small company might think, no, it's okay, I can do what I want. Okay? So there can be a problem here. Entrepreneurial people against bureaucratic people. Some people like following everything bureaucratically. Some people like just doing things spontaneously. Centrally managed versus decentralized. So a company which the decisions are made decentralized by the employees and a company which makes the decision at the CEO level. Okay? If they make a contract, again, they go to some negotiation. One person sends their CEO, the other person sends the low employee. Right? They can have some problem. Will the CEO be happy to see the low employee coming to the meeting? Company A, centrally plan. Company B, not centrally. Do you understand centrally? China is a centrally planned economy. It ha it's decided by the head, the top guys, right? Centrally planned. Here, okay? I am telling everybody what to do. Asian culture is more like this, okay? Sweden. There's only two lines. And nobody tells anybody what to do, okay? So, we have an important meeting. Sweden sent this guy here. He's just 25 young new employee, this company sends their CEO, right? Is that person going to be happy to meet the 25-year-old guy from Sweden? No. 
Is there going to be some problem in the relationship? Yes. Did we write that in the contract? The CEO needs to come to the meeting? <laughs> if we have a meeting? No, we didn't write that in the contract, right? We assumed. I assumed. Do you understand assume? I assume. Do you understand assume? Yes. Hmm? Assume means that without saying, I, I just think that's what's going to happen. Okay? Without talking about it. So we may, uh, finance driven versus operation focused. Some people think the money is more important than profit. Some people think the operations company is more important. So those kind of, we can have those kind of problems. So here's an example. Northwest Airlines, a US company, and KL, and Dutch company. What they're saying here, it wasn't so much a US Dutch problem, but it was about one of them had a different management focus, and one of them had a different risk tolerance. So KLM, they liked operations and conservative financial management. They don't want to take a risk, right? Do you understand conservative? So don't take money loans. Don't gamble on the foreign exchange market, okay? Mm, hedge the oil price. Do you understand hedge the oil price? Yes. Be sure of the oil price. Very conservative financial management, okay? What about the Americans? Right? Risk. They like the risk. Let's gamble on the exchange rate. Let's gamble on the oil price. I think the oil price is going down, right? So these guys like risk. These guys don't like risk. But they didn't think about that when they made the deal. They didn't talk about that, okay? So can you see that they would have a problem? Yes. Right? So they did have a problem. They couldn't get on together because of their different values. Do you understand different values? Yes. Different ideas? Different personalities? Yes? But then, in the US, they said this is not so much a US Dutch clash, but also US culture, they're more risk taking, right? Maybe because the people who went to the US, they were risk takers, right? People from Korea who went to the US, are they more risk taking or less risk taking than normal people in Korea? More risk takers, right? They, they go to the US to make a new life and they take a big risk, right? They don't have any family or contacts there. So just Culturally, US people are more okay with risk, okay? but other countries not as much. Okay, so here are some questions we can ask. Is this a short term or long term deal? Is it open ended or task focused? Will it be learning or production oriented? Do we believe in lifetime or at will employment? So, do we believe in keeping the employees for uh, the long term? or just hiring people on the short term, right? So these are kind of questions that we should ask uh, at the start, right? When we get to know the person, okay? About the underlying social contract. <coughs> so we can ask those, we can talk about those factors. The point is we talk about those things in advance with the other person. We discuss those things. Uh, then we can, if we discuss those things early, we can avoid having the difficulty later. Right? Can you believe that Northwest Airlines and Royal Dutch, who are two very big companies, didn't think about this problem when they negotiated the agreement and wrote all of the agreement? Right? Took a lot of time, but they didn't think about this big problem. Okay? That the owners, the presidents. CEOs of the companies was very different and had very different ideas, yes. right? Can you believe they didn't think about that problem? And then they failed because of that, right? So companies do make mistakes in the real life. They say this is a common mistake. They focus too much on the economic contract. Do you understand economic contract? Just the price and this and that, okay? And then they don't focus enough on the social contract. Do they have the same ideas? Do they have the same values? 
So one thing which can help with this is making a pilot, pilot program. Have you ever heard of pilot program? No. Hmm? Pilot program means just testing. It's not a joint venture. A pilot is just, uh, we just do this just to test. So we can make a pilot, some pilot program together, maybe like Mazda and Ford. We do some small agreements together. And we don't make a new legal top contract. We do like a trial period. Do you understand trial period? So some people, when they're getting married, they do dunga, living together. Uh -huh. How do you say that? It's like a pilot program, right? How do you say living together in Korean? Dunga. Was I right? Yes. Hmm? So companies can also do pilot program, OK? They try out first and see if we're a good fit or not. So just to finish the questions we should ask on the underlying contract, we should ask about the real nature and purpose. Do you think this is just a transaction, or do you think it's a partnership? Okay. Do you think we're equals? The entrepreneur thinks they're equal. The investor doesn't think they're equal. The investor thinks, I'm giving all the money. I'm the boss. You're the employee. Okay. This can especially be a problem if we're working for our friends, right? We think, or our family, we think, oh, we're equal, they're my friend or they're my family, right? But actually, they might think, no, you're my employee. So later, we're going to have a problem. They're going to tell us to do something, and we're going to say, no, I don't agree. I don't think I should do that. And then they're going to say, well, I'm the boss, do what I say, right? So that's one problem working with friends, okay? Are we building the institution for the long term or making a financial investment? Is this just, are we just thinking about, is it just a financial investment for me or am I involved in the company? Okay, do you think operation, research, marketing, engineering, do you have a different idea about what's the most important in the company? So we ask those kind of questions about the nature and purpose. We can ask about the duration and the scope. Is this a short-term agreement or a long-term? Okay. Are we going to have more agreements afterwards? Okay. Uh, so on. So <coughs> this is uh, just a quote about lawyers. Lawyers can tend to confuse the deal. The working understanding between two parties with the contract. The written words that attempt to capture the understanding at a point in time. So lawyers are focusing a lot on the written words on the contract, right? This is the law. This is what you have to do. So words are good for capturing some things, like the rules of chess. Do you play chess? Ah, uh, yes. Yes? So it's easy to write the rules of chess and understand rules of chess. You can move this piece, this, and places, right? Yes. But it's not for good, good for some things. How to ride a bicycle. If you just read about how to ride a bicycle, are you able to ride a bicycle? Experience. Practice, practice. You need the experience and practical of riding the bicycle before you know how to ride the bicycle. Okay, so the words can't do everything. Okay, so what makes the deal work are not the written words, but the personal relationships between the individuals charged with making them work better. Okay, so we write the words, but the words is not everything. We also need something else: the personal relationships. So lawyers can overemphasize the the words. So do you have any question about this part, the underlying contract? No. no? Okay, so then let's uh, take a break for 10 minutes. Who needs, uh, who needs the page from the negotiation that we were doing the last time? Who needs a photocopy, new photocopy of the 